This morning, I wanna continue my series on visioneering. Last week, we began the series by talking about the visionary church and the importance of vision and getting a vision for our personal lives, but also getting a vision for this ministry. What is it, God, that you want us to do? What is it that we're to pursue by faith for God to do through us? And I wanna continue the series this morning by talking about the church with a cause. Church with a cause. Last week, when we talked about a visionary church, we're really answering the questions, what, where, how? But this morning, in a church with a cause, we're asking the most important question, and answering the most important question is why? Why? Why is always the most important question? Why are we doing this? What is this all about? What is this founded upon? And so I wanna set the stage for you as we read in John 18, 37, this morning is our theme passage, that we have an innocent man who is standing in front of a judge. He's facing a barrage of questions that will ultimately determine his future. He's answering these questions directly. He's, he's confronting the moment. He's not shirking back from the responsibilities of the moment. And the governor of the state is standing in front of him and he asks him a probing question. He says, are you a king then? Here is the definitive answer that Jesus gave in that moment. John 18, 37, the Bible says this. For you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause, say that phrase with me, for this cause. For this cause I was born and for this cause, say it again. I have come into this world. For you rightly say that I'm a king for this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into this world. Father, this morning, I pray, Lord, today that you would help us to embrace the cause for which we've been created. Lord, I pray that we would embrace the cause for which this church was founded in 1928. Lord, for all these years, you have sustained us and provided for us and worked miracle after miracle on our behalf because, Lord, we have continually, decade upon decade, generation upon generation, embraced the cause. And so, Lord, today I pray that you will help this message to come alive in our heart more than just something that we talk about with mere words, but that, Lord, there would be a divine invitation and a divine obligation placed upon our lives by which our lives will become aligned, by which our lives will submit to you with purpose so that, God, you could bless us and use us and build your kingdom through us on this earth like never before. We ask this, Lord, now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. You'll notice a recurring phrase that you repeated twice in John 18, 37, where Jesus says, for this cause. That phrase, for this cause, is a statement of certainty and conviction. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew what he was about. Jesus knew the purpose of his life. And I wonder, can we say that about our lives? Do we have that sense of identity in him? That sense of purpose while being here on earth? Jesus had spoken of his death in John 12, 27, where he used that phrase again. He said, for this cause, I have come to this hour. Everything in my life, from the birth there in Bethlehem, through his childhood of amazing the temple scholars, through all the years of silence where we know nothing about him, everything in that moment, his three and a half year ministry, is culminating at this moment, at this time, to die for all of us. To die for our mistakes, our sins, our failures, our shortcomings. His entire life was encapsulated in that one powerful phrase, for this cause. So we see in this that Jesus is seized by this cause to forgive and redeem a fallen mankind. The question for us this morning is, is are we seized with this cause? He was seized with the cause, but are we? Because many times, even as believers, we're pretty much kind of living for ourselves. We're kind of living for our desires, our wants, the things that make us comfortable, the things that prosper us. Another question for us this morning, are we building our kingdom or his? Because the purpose for which you were placed upon this earth the purpose behind your salvation is that you would become someone who begins to build his kingdom. That you would begin to set your life upon eternal things. We must allow the cause of Christ to find its rightful place in our lives. There are those who look at their life in despair this morning and wonder why in the world was I even born? Why, why am I just taking up space? Why am I just walking around breathing just day after day? Some say, I wish I'd never been born. Because without the cause, the futility of life can be frustrating 
and will prevent you from seeing your greater connection to the world, but ultimately your greater connection to God. Your Christianity will never perfectly make sense to you until you begin to align yourself with God's cause. Your relationships, your talents, your anointing, your calling, all those things you possess, every single person in this room possesses those things, but it will have no purpose or meaning until you begin to discover God's cause. When you stand firm on the word of God, you also begin to see a much bigger picture as the cause puts everything into perspective. It takes all those abstract ideas that's difficult sometimes for us to understand and begins to make meaning to us about how those things affect how we live in the day in and day out world. And suddenly you find that life makes sense and you can also state with conviction, for this cause I was born. Here's why I'm still here. Here's why God has me on this earth. Cause creates the context for the reasons we do what we do. There were two young men that went to visit their pastors separately, both of them in their early 20s, both of them sharp, smart, ambitious. The first young man says, Pastor, I believe that God is gonna make me a millionaire by the age of 30. He's given me the talent, the gifts, the humility, obviously, to do those things and the determination to get there. The second young man comes to him and says, Pastor, I believe that God is going to use and prosper in my life because I believe that God has called me to fund the salvation of the earth. Let me ask you, which of the two young men were seized by the cause? The second one. Who do you think that God will get behind to bless? The second one. Why is that? Because the, the second young man understood that his life, his talents, his abilities, his resources are there in order to build the kingdom of God. When that happens, there is no, uh, no good thing that God will withhold from such a person like that. God will bless those who begin to determine to live according to his cause. It's great to have goals. I believe it's great to be ambitious in life. But the second man's vision is more powerful because it is linked to the cause, because it serves the king and the kingdom. A vision without a cause is nothing more than a set of personal goals. A vision attached to a cause is more than a hit and miss affair. That vision is alive and possesses power to change the world. Do you realize that within you and what you do, no matter what your station in life is, no matter what your occupation may be, you have the power within yourself to change the world? Oh, not exclusively by yourself, but collectively when you're attached together with other believers, the cause of Christ can come alive and together we can change the world. If you believe that, say amen. There's a lot of books that have been written about vision and I believe in vision. That's why I led with vision last week. That's why this series is called Visioneering. And on the scriptural side of vision, the word of God speaks about vision and how people live carelessly without it as we looked from Proverbs 29 last week. Another verse of scripture I love comes from Habakkuk chapter two, verse two, where it says when, it, when we begin to understand the vision God gives us that we're to write it down and we are to make it plain that he who reads it may run. What does that mean? Well, if we have a vision and it's clearly stated, there is an empowerment that comes to people's lives to motivate them, to push them forward, to set them free, to run, to run with that vision, to run with God, to do something great for him. On the practical side, when a group of people get behind a vision, that vision adds motivation and life to that organization. The vision gives us focus and direction. But what is more important this morning? What is more important, a vision or a cause? Well, the answer is a cause. While it's essential to carry vision and to be people of vision, a cause is much more powerful. Why? Because it answers that ultimate question, why? We talk a lot about visions and dreams and destiny, but it is on the foundation of a cause that vision is birth. Vision is so much more powerful when it's built upon a cause. So this morning, I'm gonna have a lot of fill in the blanks. We're gonna move quickly through this message this morning. I'm gonna look at the ways in which a vision and a cause differentiates itself between one another. Number one, a vision can be personal, but a cause is bigger than any one person. Visions come and go. Visions oftentimes change with leadership. We're in the midst of still of a leadership transition. Visions will change from one leader to another, from one perspective to another, but a cause is bigger than any one person. People can talk about their vision with excitement and enthusiasm that motivates others, but the reality is the cause is greater than any one individual or person. 
I have a personal vision for my life. I, I hope you discover a personal vision for your life. This church is discovering vision for our future, but the cause of Jesus is bigger than any one church, any one leader, any one individual. What is the cause? Well, the cause of Christ is simply to know him and to make him known. And that responsibility is beyond any one group, any one church, any one denomination, any one leader. The cause includes every person living upon planet earth. Therefore, when we begin to ask, who is my brother? The entire world is our brother. What are our responsibilities to that brother? It is to make Jesus known to them, that Jesus might come alive in them, that Jesus might transform them, whether they're across the street or around the world. Every person must know him, and every person who knows him must make him known until every person knows him. And if our church has the cause and our spirit, we will automatically partner in our corporate vision, and our personal lives will overflow with vision that God gives to our future. Here's number two. A vision is something you possess, but a cause possesses you. Amen. Jesus was captivated and consumed by the cause. It affected and directed every aspect of his life. It was something he possessed, but the cause also possessed him. When we think about someone being possessed, what does that mean? It completely overtakes them. It infuses every part of them. It changes their character, their nature, their behavior. We often think of it in terms of demon possession, of the darkness that infiltrates and possesses someone. But what happens when the cause of God possesses you? That it begins to affect how you look upon things, how you speak, the decisions you make, the money you spend. All of those things become infused by this cause. And when you're committed to a cause, you don't have to make up a vision for your life. It takes hold of you and begins to influence everything that you do. Number three. You wouldn't die for a vision, but you will die for a cause. In the days following the demise of the Soviet Union, the, the eyes of the entire world were focused on a little town called Grozny. I don't know if you remember this. In this town of Grozny, there was a group of Chechen rebels who were making a stand against the might and the power of the Russian army. They weren't fighting for a vision. They were fighting to the death for their cause. In a similar way, and I want you to make sure you understand where I'm coming from. We have witnessed suicide bombers give themselves completely for their cause. I'm not trying to radicalize you today. I don't want anyone watching online to think that we're trying to radicalize people in Visalia, California. Hear me, friends, though. People won't die for someone else's vision, but many people will choose to die for a cause no matter how terrible or misguided it may be. These people became so consumed with this cause that we would, we would think was demonic, we would agree is misguided and dark. However, you have to give attention to them, you have to regard them because they have become possessed by this cause. When's the last time that you were passionate for something outside of yourself or your own selfish interest? Right. Pastor Mark, will you die for your wife? Absolutely. Will you die for your kids? Absolutely. Will I die for your kids? Let's, let's hang on a second here. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I will die for the things that are mine, but when's the last time that you became so passionate that you were willing to die for something that didn't directly affect you or bless you? That's what God did when he sent Jesus. Jesus didn't die for his sin. He died for mine. Jesus didn't die for his sin, he died for yours. He was so passionately committed to this cause, though it was difficult, though he sweat great drops of blood from his pores in the Garden of Gethsemane, he still contended to be faithful to that cause because that cause was something so much bigger. I'm wondering when the church of Jesus Christ can get to a point where we begin to realize that the greatest things that, that are in our life lies outside of our own personal interest that we could identify, that we could live for, that we could get behind something that's bigger than us. Jesus predicted his death on the cross in John 12, 27, saying, but for this cause, I come to this hour. Jesus died for this cause. When we catch a revelation of the cause, then no sacrifice becomes too great. Number four, a vision has options, but a cause leaves you with no choice. Again, John 12, 27. Jesus told his disciples about his death. He knew there was no other way. He said, now my soul is troubled. This wasn't easy. This wasn't easy. My soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. 
We remember the words of Jesus. If this cup can pass from me, if there's some other way, Lord, please, I don't want to go through this. Nevertheless, what? Not my will, but yours be done. Because Lord, if this is the cause and there's no other choice, I'll be faithful to that cause. A vision, we can take it or leave it. It has options. If things become discouraging, you can put it aside or you can change direction. You can choose to run with a vision or you can choose to abandon it. We see this in the life of Jesus in his earthly ministries. The disciples were seized by a vision though it was a little bit wonky and messed up. They thought that Jesus was coming as an earthly leader in order to establish the kingdom in Israel to restore the pride and the dignity of the Jewish people to push out the Romans. Jesus dies, he's laid in the tomb. Suddenly, their visions of grandeur are dashed, they're gone. What do they do? Well, they exercise their option to go back to their nets. They walk away, they say, well, this isn't what I signed up for. That wasn't the vision I thought Jesus was trying to impart. But Jesus was not seized by a vision by which he had options. He was seized by a cause that said, even though my soul is troubled, even though my soul is in anguish, I will willingly lay down my life to fulfill the cause of redeeming mankind. I will go to the cross and die. You can hold a vision in your hand, but the cause holds you in its hand. The apostle Paul spoke about how the love of God compelled him, drove him seized him. In other words, it left him with no other choice. When your life is gripped by the cause, the options disappear. There are so many things that we have obligations on our life for as it relates to the scripture. There are certain things that God has told us to do, but we treat them like options on a car. It's like we go car shopping and say, do we want power windows or no power windows? Do we want a sunroof or no sunroof? Well, I'll serve Jesus, but I won't evangelize. I'll, I'll serve Jesus, but I won't commit myself to the word. I'll, I'll serve Jesus, but I won't give. I will serve Jesus, but I won't serve anything outside that takes any of my time. We treat all these things as options. But when the cause takes hold of you, you say, Lord, whatever I am, it's yours. Whatever I've got, it's yours. I want you to know something, friends. I am not a perfect guy, but I determined very early on I was going to live for this cause. That living for the cause, my marriage has been established upon it. I've raised my kids. When they were born, I gave them to God and said, listen, for this cause, take them, Lord. I, I have no claim to them anymore. I have grew up in middle America and I've run from the East Coast to the West Coast pursuing this cause to be faithful to God. And if God calls me to go all the way around the world, oh God, please don't do that. I, I will do it. I will do it. I kind of like it here in California, Lord. Just saying, just saying, Okay. But I will do it, why? Because there's no other choice. Whatever claim God has upon my life, I have no right to take it back because Jesus gave himself totally and completely for me. And I've been blessed far more than I could ever deserve. And though I've been faithless and though I've been sinful and though I've made mistakes, God has continually loved me and moved through me and blessed me because I think at some level I said, God, all of it, it's yours, you can have it. Number five, number five, a vision can be ignored, but you cannot ignore a cause. I don't know what your particular route was when you drove to church this morning, but chances are you drove by several organizations in this community that have vision statements. Walgreens, McDonald's, Arby's, um, local banks, all of them have vision statements. I mean, it's, it's cool to have a vision statement. Chances are that you have recognized their logos, but chances are also that 90% of these groups that you that have these visions or mistakes, you, you don't know what they are. You don't know what they stand for. You don't know what they say that they believe or exist for. The point is that you can ignore someone else's vision, but you cannot ignore a cause. Listen, if you live in the Middle East, you can't ignore ISIS. Mm -mm, no. They're, they're pursued by a cause. Again, we, it's dark, it's terrible, it's awful, it's demonic, it's satanic. But they're so pursued, uh, they have so pursued a cause in their life, so possessed by a cause, you cannot ignore them. You must regard them and respect them because of their dedication to the cause. If the cause of Christ takes hold of your life, those around you will not be able to ignore it either. But the problem with the church in America is we're becoming subliminal. We're fading into the background. We're like white noise in the chatter of society. There's no one really regarding us. 
There's no one really seeing us. Listen, the churches in this community, as big and beautiful as this building is, people drive by and never think a thing about us. Why? Because the church itself, I'm talking about all of us as people, we are the church. We have become subliminal in the workplace. We've become subliminal in the little league. We're subliminal on the golf course. We're subliminal in the places of leisure. We have just faded into the background so that no one will uh, regard us because we don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to be maligned. We don't want to be made fun of. No, my friends, when we become pursued by a cause, we're going to step out. We're going to be recognized. We're going to be regarded. People are going to have to take notice of our life because we stand for something that we have value values, that we don't do things the way other people do things. We take stands for righteousness. We tell the truth. We have conviction. All of those things will cause us to stand out and to be recognized, but you must be pursuing a cause in your life. Number six, a vision can exist for you, but you exist for the cause. One of the differences between having a vision and living for a cause is that a vision can exist for your own purposes and interest. But when it comes to a cause, You exist for the sake of it. Within our church, I have a vision and the staff I'm sure has vision and that may differ slightly here and there. In these cases, we have to guard against this because within organizations like ours, that's dedicated to the preaching of the gospel, multiple visions causes division. Let me say another division. I'm emphasizing the die. We go divergent paths in our vision when we have multiple voices that try to articulate it. That's why in the church we believe in the federal headship of authority. That means that God speaks from heaven. He speaks through a pastor leader. That leader speaks to the church and together we unite around this vision rather than trying to have our own agenda, rather than trying to push our own purposes, rather than trying to recreate the church in our own image and our own desires and our own wants. Why is that? Because we believe that there's a cause that's higher than all this, that's higher than what I want, higher than what I desire, higher than my preferences, higher than all of these things that I try to bring to the table. It's, it, without that, we will not have the unity unity of the spirit, the unity of the faith that God calls us to have. So each vision within the ministry of the church must be connected and founded upon and exist for the cause. Much of vision, much of what we permit within the church is just to make people happy. Sometimes we include things and we call it vision just to accommodate the saints. The problem is, is we as the saints, we have been so spoon fed for so long. I'm talking about the big C church. And we've tried to shape the church in our own images, uh, I- images and interests and wants and desires that we've become ineffective and impotent in our preaching of the gospel. And in doing so, we are a church who is asleep in the light. That's why my first message to you, the precursor to this series, was a challenge to the comfortable. And the scripture I read to you from Romans 12 says, we must awake out of slumber. We gotta stop being spiritual Rip Van Winkles. We're gonna miss the greatest move of God that the world has ever seen until we come alive and say, I'm not living for my self-interest anymore. God, I'm living for your interest and whatever that means, whatever that takes, whatever I have to give, I will give it, Lord, to be faithful to you. Number seven. Only the best of visions will outlast you, but a cause is eternal. There will come a day many years from now, hopefully, that some pastor who's younger than me will come to Shepherd V1. In his discovery period, he will be looking through old files, pictures. He'll find a picture of me and Gretchen and say, why did that chick marry him? I'd say, First question will come to his mind. Second statement he will make is, that guy really outkicked his punt coverage when he married her. But beyond that, he'll say, who who is that guy? Uh, What what was it about him? What, What happened while he was there? What happened on his watch? You see, there will come a day when the things that I'm giving my life for now will go largely unnoticed because of time and separation. However, if those who follow me in the future burn with the same passion of the cause in my heart, there will be a seamless flow and transition of ministry that will continue until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was just discovering this week that, you know, there's been transitions that's gone on around the country at the same time as the one that happened here and many of them aren't going so well and ours is going really, really well, folks. I just want to tell you. 
Thank you, Jesus, and thank you to all of you. Why is that? Because I think there's a burning in my heart that, that, that was the same burning in Mike's heart. And before him, there was a burning in Rich's heart. And before him, there was a burning in Pastor Dobson's heart. Before that, the burning in Pastor Cumpy's heart. And when that begins to happen and we begin to connect our hearts to the cause, not to people or personalities or personal self-interest, then we, we have something that's eternal. It's a, it's a stream, it's a flow. It's coming from heaven to earth and out into the community and it's glorifying God. We must make sure that whatever we do is eternal. Buildings and land may outlast me and my vision, but the cause of the king and the kingdom will continue into eternity. Number eight, a vision is allowed to change, but the cause never changes. There are times when we need to modify our vision or perhaps even change or expand it. We're in one of those moments right now. It's not because that the old vision was bad. It's because we're just in a new day, a new season. There's new leadership. People who see things from a different perspective. Maybe things that God's speaking to them that's unique to a burden that's upon their heart. I know that throughout the years for my personal life, my, my vision has evolved many, many times. You can change your vision anytime that you choose to, though it's inadvisable. But friends, if I change the vision of our church every time that I read a new and exciting book on church growth or went to a church conference or talked to a consultant or a trusted leader, we would all have spiritual motion sickness. We would have to provide those little bags in the front of your seat like you do on the airplane. Because you'd all be green and queasy because I'd be moving you to the left and to the right and the left and the right and forward and backward, stop and hold and oh, And everybody would be just kind of sick and nauseated from it all. There are those who always desire to tweak the vision to generate more enthusiasm. However, I said to God, God, I believe you've given me a vision that is established upon the cause. And if it's established upon the cause, then may the cause be completed in and through me. And therefore, Lord, I don't have to change it. It's not my job to fulfill it. God, it's just my job to be faithful to it. It's not my power, it's not my personality, it's not my knowledge, it's not anything I bring to the table. God, it's just my sub submitted obedience and willingness to you to do whatever you wanna do in this place because it's your church and not my church. Therefore, God, I am committed to your cause, a cause that never changes. Methodologies change, but the cause never changes. Music changes, but the cause never changes. People and personnel come and go, but the cause always remains. Buildings rise and fall, but the cause always stand strong. If you believe that, come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. You said that you can come back, number nine, the final thing here, when you get behind his cause, he will get behind your vision. Man, do you want favor, blessing, supernatural help? Stop trying to beg God to get behind what you're doing and just get behind what he's doing. Say, God, whatever it is, I, I'm gonna live my life for that. Because this isn't about me, Lord. This, it's, it's really about you. By surrendering your life to his cause, he will breathe life into your vision. Amen. Listen, I'm gonna say to every business owner in this place, are you struggling in your business? Align yourself with God's cause and watch God bless you. You frustrated in your work, you wanna move up or be promoted or God to bless you, get behind his cause. If you will live for his cause, he will get you to the exact place that you need to be. He will promote you and bless you and elevate you to the highest places that you could ever achieve if you live centered behind his cause. Jesus said, if anyone left houses, land, or families for the sake of the gospel, for the cause, they would receive a hundredfold return. If I was selling $100 bills for a dollar, how many would you buy? Come on, come on. Don't get spiritual, okay? If I'm selling $100 bills for a dollar, how many would you buy? You would buy all that you could get. So why are you holding back in your commitment to the cause? Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, if you will get behind the cause, if you'll leave it all behind, if like Elijah, you will burn the plows, and say, God, I am going after you even though I don't understand it. I'm making commitments to you and I don't even understand how I'm gonna do it. God, I, I'm giving 
time away that I, I need for myself. I'm giving them money away that I can keep for myself. I'm doing all these things because I believe, Lord, if I get behind your cause, you will get behind me. And he says, I will, I'll bless you a hundredfold. Today, what's holding you back? Today, what's, what's holding you back from moving from being a nominal, casual Christian, a fan of Jesus, to becoming a fully functioning follower of His? What's keeping you back? When your focus is upon the cause, you will do nothing but experience the blessing of God. Oh, Pastor, you mean my life will be perfect and everything will come up roses? No, no, even roses have their thorns. But even in the midst of your sorrow, even in the midst of your valley, you will feel the presence of God. Even in the midst of your lack, the provision of God will be there. In your highs, He will be there. In your lows, He will be there. The presence of God will be with you. On its own, our vision has limitations. But when linked to the cause of Christ, it has supernatural power and purpose. Any vision is only as powerful as the cause it's built upon. If we build our lives and everything that we have and everything that we are upon this cause, then there is no limitation, no capacities that limit your life in any way you will rise to be blessed by God. So what now, pastor, what now? Well, to fulfill the cause, we will not back up. We will not give up. We will not shut up. We will not turn back until everyone in this valley knows Jesus. That's the cause. You say, pastor, we're doing pretty good at this church. Yeah, we are, but relative to what? You got loved ones that are still lost, our job's not done. You got coworkers that are lost, our job's not done. People on your street that's lost, our job's not done. Do we have a violence problem in this valley? Yes, our job's not done. A drug problem? Yes, our job's not done. Do we have a homeless problem? Yes, our job's not done. You see, as long as there's still something out there that hasn't become completely redeemed, our job is not over. We gotta keep working and giving and committing ourselves to this cause over and over and over again. And every time that our self-interest begin to crowd in the way, we've got to repent and resign and step back and say, God, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about my church. It's not about... uh, uh, public image or approval. God, this is about your cause for which I continually give my life to it. So I'm gonna preach, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna love, I'm gonna care, I'm gonna sacrifice until everyone in this valley knows Jesus. So don't don't get it confused this morning. It's not about Pastor Mark's vision. Who cares? Who cares? I'm just the mouthpiece that comes through. It's not about me. It's not about a singular dream. It's not about a singular vision. It's not about a singular goal. It's about fulfilling the cause that God has called us to. Come on, let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, right now for every person in this room. Thank you, Lord, right now that you're gonna save people in just a few moments and people's lives are gonna be changed and transformed. That is your cause. Lord, I believe that's why this church was raised up in 1928. I believe that's why for a couple of decades now, Lord, people have been saved almost in every service we've had. Because Lord, we are seized by this cause. We we believe, God, this cause is what it's about. But Lord, it's not about an organizational decision. It's a personal decision. And Lord, here's what I know. Not all of us are possessed by that cause. But God, I'm praying today, somehow, some way, your spirit will speak into lives and say, oh, come closer. Let's go higher. Let's go deeper. Let's embrace this cause like we never have before. So Father, today I pray, Lord, that you'll move not only to save people, but also to inspire and to capture the hearts of the people that you love and the people who love you, that God, we would be seized by this cause. In Jesus' name I pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. I wanna talk to people who are lost in this room for just a moment. In 1928, a church started, this church. It occupied a location, I believe, in Con- on Conyer, Walnut, now Acres, beginning with one building over here where the children are worshiping this morning, and this one built in 2018. 
I want you to think about that. I want you to think about, in the course of this ministry, how many millions and millions of dollars adjusted for inflation with interest has been spent from 1928 until now. Why? For you, for you, for this moment. The great dream of this organization, this church, this ministry, has not been to build a building just for the sake of building buildings. It's, it's to build storehouses, barns, harvest centers, so that people just like you could intersect with people like us, seized by a cause, so that your life can spiritually come alive, so that your sins can be forgiven, your body can be healed, your family put back together, your life delivered, for you to live in peace and joy. Everything, everything, everything that we do here is for that one purpose, that one single thing. Every special event, every concert, every ministry, every thing is all about this moment of your life changing. So how about it? Does your life need to change? Are you sensing that moment that God has drawn you here at this moment for your life to change forever? I think God's given you a vision for what your life could be with him. But now it's time to give yourself completely to that cause. Say, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. If that's you, you're ready to do it, raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Yes, yes, up at the top. I see you, thank you, thank you. Over here to my, yeah, I see you. Thank you, thank you, I see you. Over here to my, yes, several of you over here on my right-hand side. God bless you, right here in the front. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Come on, pray this prayer out loud with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. He lived his life for mine. He gave his life for mine. Now, Jesus, I give my life to you. You've given me forgiveness. I'm giving you my sins, my mistakes and my failures, my broken heart, my shattered dreams. Receive me now, Jesus. I'm a sinner in need of your help. Cleanse me, change me. Move through me today, tomorrow, and all through the rest of my life. I give everything to you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand.